Welcome, everybody. It's my pleasure today to introduce Ana Garcia, who will be telling us about by Lipschitz embeddings of the space of persistence barcodes. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's well a very well known seminar, so it's really great to be able to talk to you today. Um, so, well, today I'm going to talk to you about um, two topics. Um, so, it's an intersection between metric geometry and uh, topological data analysis. Um, and this work is joined with David Bate. Um, so, I'll start by introducing the space of a, well, the, the, some transportation distances. And um, we start with a set, um, omega, a subset of Rn, uh, which is non-empty and is proper. And then we take two finite measures on omega and um, finite Borel and, um, we recall that the p Wasserstein distance between mu and nu is defined by minimizing um, the, the integral of omega cross omega uh, of the distance, the p distance of, um, well, the, the distance to the p uh, over all measures gamma on omega cross omega with coordinate projections uh, such that uh, the first projection projects to omega uh, to sorry mu and the second projection projects to nu. And so this is the formal definition, but for those unfamiliar, I will give you the idea with a picture later on. Um, but one thing that we can point out is that this distance is only useful to compare measures uh, that have equal total mass. Because although it is defined whenever you have different total masses, uh, Wasserstein of those uh, measures is infinity. And this is, um, this WP is an example of a transportation metric on probability measures. So probability measures are those uh, that, um, that the total mass is equal to one. And um, right. And so then the intuition uh, of, of the Wasserstein distance is that WP measures the optimal cost to transport the mass mu to the mass nu taking into account the distance that this mass has to be moved. And so we'll see now a little picture here. Um, right, so I'll denote by delta x to the Dirac mass at x, at the point x, and that just means that uh, it has mass one at x. And so, for example, we consider these two discrete measures. Um, so the sum of the racks on points xi and the sum of the racks, same number I'm considering in this example, um, sum of the racks at y's. And so to calculate, um, uh, yeah, so then this mu um, equidistributes masses across the xi's and nu does the same. Um, and so we want to calculate um, Wasserstein P of uh, nu and mu. And for that, um, the, the idea is that, so just to put a, an example is that you can, so you can think that you have one kilo of sugar at each, each Xi and that you need to distribute this sugar into bakeries at y, j. So then this uh, x1, um, in, in this case, its closest vector is this one. 
and uh, x2 its closest bakery is here and x3 the closest location is uh, y2 and so then we want to minimize um we want to first match the x size with the yj's and then minimize the lp sum of distances and so this is how we would calculate uh, in this instance and um so as i said before um a drawback of bus sign is that um you need to have equal masses and so partial uh, optimal transport um, was introduced to be able to compare masses with different, uh, sorry, measures with different total masses. Um, right. So Figali and Gigli in 2010 defined a WBP of mu and nu. So this is the metric that um, that that is defined by minimizing the integral of omega cross omega of the uh, distance the to the p of between x and y and um, and then this is minimized uh, overall measures omega in the closure of omega. So before we didn't have the closure, it was just omega. But now what we ask, because the definition is very similar, but this subtlety is what allows us to do much more. That now the coordinate projections of gamma, we're asking that they agree with uh, mu and with nu respectively, but only inside omega. So we're not asking anything about the whole closure. And this then allows us to basically be able to destroy mass at the boundary or to borrow mass from the boundary. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so since the projections only have to agree in omega, um, we have that it may be cheaper to transport some of the mass of mu or nu to a, uh, the boundary of omega. And so this depends on whether some of the mass of mu is closer to the boundary than to some of the mass of nu or vice versa. And um, yes, okay. So now we have a, a, we will have a look at a picture. So then again, um we have our discrete masses in this case we can now have different um di different discrete uh, masses uh, the, the different number of discrete masses uh, without the normalization term that i had earlier so that mu and nu have different total mass and um again uh this is the same picture than before. I added um, this extra point, but before um, we were matching X1 and Y3 and Y1 and X2 and X2 and X3 because all of them were uh, in the definition, we had to match each of these, um, each of the kilos of sugar to, its, to a, a bakery, but in this case, um, we're actually allowed to throw away some sugar if um, it's not uh, cheap to take the sugar into the bakery at Y2, even though it's the closest. And we're also allowed to have more sugar than, um, or more bakeries that don't get fulfilled um, in, in our setting. And so, we can uh, destroy the mass by sending it to the boundaries. And so, uh, yes, yeah, so now to calculate a WBP, uh, we match now the X size and the YJs, not just between X size and YJs, but now we have the chance of matching them to their 
closest point in the boundary. And um, WVP of mu and nu will be the minimum of the LP sum, sum of distances. Uh, and here I just wrote what the minimum in this instance should be. Um, yeah, because they're closest to the boundary. So then we decide to throw them away. So now we come to the relationship between partial um, transportation and persistence barcodes. So we have the space of measures WVP omega. So all the Borel measures that have a piece, um, finite piece moment. And um, we equip this with the metric that we saw earlier with WVP. And um, right, so um, in 1983, a work of Armgren um, uses discrete measures to represent on order K tuples. And so we can say that the sum of these Dirac mat, uh, masses, uh, cor like it, it, it corresponds to this uh, sequence of points, x1 to xk, and we allow repetitions. So it's a formal way to, to, to represent uh, these k tuples, which you may know as a multiset in uh, the setting of persistence. Um, and then in 2019, Devol and Lacombe, uh, they identify the space of persistence barcodes with the set of discrete measures in WVP uh, omega, where omega in this case is the upper half plane. Um, yeah, so then they uh, introduce, uh, they relate the persistence barcodes uh, to Figali and Gilgis partial transportation. Right, and so now um, we come to um, by Lipschitz embeddings, which is uh, the second uh, part of this talk, which, um, so I recall that if you have a map between two metric spaces, uh, X and Y, we will call it by Lipschitz if there exists a constant greater or equal than one, such that the distance of the of two points in the image is controlled by the distances in the domain up to a multiplicative factor. This C that we have there. And so the by Lipschitz maps are um, the natural way to study the geometry of a metric space. Um, the isometries are too rigid um, and by Lipschitz maps give us an equivalence of metric spaces that define the same metric geometry. Um, for example, if you have that two uh, spaces are by Lipschitz equivalent, uh, these by Lipschitz maps preserve the metric properties uh, of these spaces, uh, like if X has tangents, so will Y, and there's many other properties that get preserved up to this distortion. So it's, they're nice and leggings. And right. So not every metric space is by Lipschitz embeddable into Euclidean space. And so then a natural question to ask, uh, but not even metric spaces that are constructed from subsets of Rn and very uh, simple relations. And so then this motivates the question of embeddability of um, WBP omega into Euclidean space. 
And so in general, this is not the case for like for general omega. And an important example for us is the space of barcodes, uh, which was proved by Bauer and Carrier in 2019. And so then it means that we need a larger space. Um, so perhaps um, then the, the next question to ask would be whether WBP of omega by Lipschitz embeds into Hilbert space? And so the answer is no, again. And the reason for this is that uh, WBP omega contains copies of Wasserstein of any cube in Rn. And um, this makes a WBP, like W, Wasserstein is a really large space. And so then that, the, the fact that it contains already a very large space, then it's, it's it, it means that it, yeah, like it, it's going to be hard to embed that one. And um, what uh, happens is that for P different than two, and any n, we and, and any n-dimensional cube, we can put this cube with the LP norm inside Wasserstein because, as I said, Wasserstein uh, is a very large space inside Wasserstein of a cube. And Rademacher theorem says that C will not embed into Hilbert space for large enough n. And this is for any by Lipschitz constant. And um, so then what happens when P is equal to two? So for P equals to two, this is a highly non-trivial result. And um, basically, so Wasserstein two of a cube does not embed into Hilbert space. So for n greater or equal than three, this is a result of Andoni, now Neyman, uh, that they proved in 2015. And they also announced a result for n equals to two. And this is for, uh, this is by Austin and Auer, but um, there is the announcement in this, uh, paper, but there's not uh, a preprint um, yet. And then can I As, ask a question? I guess. Anna, for the um, for the p not equal to two, um, does that does that mean p is larger than two, or it, could p also be strictly between one and two, for example? Yeah, that that holds for every p. Okay. Uh, for every P that is not two, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, right, okay. Um, so now, um, uh, now we will talk about unordered M tuples. So we define the space BM of omega to be the, the space of, at most M on order tuples. So as I uh, showed you before, these correspond to the tuples X1 to XK. Um, and so then uh, the theorem is that BM omega is by Lipschitz embeddable into Hilbert space with distortion equal, uh, well, distortion on, on, of the order of M to the M plus five halves and if you equip um, bm omega with another p norm because in this one we are regarding it as a subset of wv2 then we slightly change the distortion for it, it slightly increases to m to the n plus Three. And so 
then from here we obtain um, uh, we, we can apply this to the space of our codes. Um, so the corollary the is, yes. Sorry, the distortion is sort of the um, size of this constant C in the bilipschitz embedding. Uh, yes. Yes. So okay. this this would be like the the best uh, bilipschitz constant that you would get. Yeah. Thank you. Um. Right, and so the yes, so the corollary is that the space of persistence barcodes again um, taking omega to be the upper half plane, um, and uh, so then this space at most uh, with at most m bars, which I lost the omega here, so that. I mean, because you know that is the upper half plane, and then um, this space by Lipschitz embed into Hilbert space. And um, consequences of that is that, uh, well, maybe first an observation is that the embedding is constructive. And um, then because we have this embedding, then uh, BM inherits the inner product of Hilbert space and the inner product uh, satisfies uh, this inequality. So basically it is controlled by the distortion of the map. Um, and um, by Lipschitz embeddings are significantly stronger than coarse embeddings because they give you this type of relationships. Uh, they give you control over the distance. Um, and so this is an improvement of a course embedding, the, the course embedding of BM that uh, Mitra and Buck proved in 2019. And yes, um, well, thank you very much. That's it. All right, well, thank you very much, Anna. And before we get to questions, let's briefly unmute ourselves to applaud. So questions for the speaker. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Can you tell us any sort of practical applications of this embedding? I mean, is it is it is it convenient to work in this Hilbert space when trying to understand barcodes? Well, yes. I mean, first, um, because the embedding is constructive, you you can like if if you um, so if you map it into Hilbert space, then you can, for example, uh, get up approximations of the distance, like of the Wasserstein distance, and um, and also because you get inherited structure, uh, inherited linear structures from Hilbert space, then you you get to do, um, for example, kernel methods using this inner product, and um, so then you can do machine learning techniques that require inner products and. Um, yeah, so the, this would be the applicability. Thank you. No, thank you. I have a question. Um, okay. if, uh, you said that embedding is constructive. Uh, can you say a little bit about uh, what is the main tool? Yes, so um, there's, two key ingredients. So the first one is um, uh, we need the composition of the space. Uh, so uh, maybe I will um, draw a little bit. So like if you have omega, then um, the we need the composition basically is uh, the composition into cubes of omega. And so the cubes start looking 
like smaller and smaller as you get to the boundary. Um, like, I mean, this is not quite as good, but maybe I'll, I'll make um, like the upper half plane. So it's like, um, you start, uh, so th this whole thing is meant to be omega, the, the upper half plane. I'll, um, and so then the first thing is that we just decompose this into into cubes, um, which is the we need a composition um, that get to the boundary of omega, um, like that they become smaller and smaller as you approach the boundary. And in each of these cubes, uh, we calculate. Um, well, well, I mean, we we have a by Lipschitz map um, that uh, where basically the usual matchings are taken by the identity. So we prove that that's the case, and um, then um, the point is that a uh, Angren, um, so Angren embeds. Uh, unordered topples into Euclidean space, but it's not uh, as simple as embedding uh, the end tuples in this case into Euclidean space. You do need the, the um, an infinite dimensional, uh, basically you need L2. And um, so then once that we construct uh, the local embeddings in each of these uh, cubes, then we use Amgren and then we show that uh, this is a, like it's a well defined by Lipschitz and that we have a control, a global control over the, over the Lipschitz constant. So uh, whose re result uh, uh, you are saying as you, you said some name? Ah, uh, yes. So it's, uh, it's uh, like on Q valued functions. And what is the, what is the result? Yeah, sorry. Uh, right. So the, the result is that you can embed uh, M uh, an order an ordered um, how is it? You can embed a, an order right. So given M, then you can embed the space of M on order tuples into Euclidean space. Uh -huh. So this is for fixed M, and you always have uh, M tuples. Okay, so you use this embedding and then you, so the cubes you are saying is, is this probably like Whitney type cubes, right? Smaller and smaller at the boundary. So. Yes, uh, so we use local local uh, embeddings of Amgren uh, in each of these cubes. So for each of these cubes, we, we have one of these embeddings that Amgren, that Amgren has. But then you need to basically um, put them together um, because you need to make sure that they still are well defined and that they are by Lipschitz and that the constant is still fine uh, between the cubes. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. I had a, another question. So, um... The Lipschitz constant, you you described it a little bit in terms of m, for example, um, big O of m to some power. Um, ha have you looked at all what the what the constants are in that big O term? Uh, yes. Uh, so we have we have the constant like so in the paper we have the actual constant, but it's like really horrendous um uh, but maybe i can uh, email you the actual constant but yeah we did calculate it because at 
each step, like at each step of the of this process where we are like constructing a local one and then a, a larger one, um, like the from the local to the global, it keeps on changing. And so then you get like some terms that are accumulating. Um, and uh -huh. yeah. 